Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Now I'm here uh, with my new good friend, <laughs> Andre Boada, yeah. um, at the Texas Hill Country Winery Symposium. I know it doesn't look like that. We're actually staying at a friend's. Yeah, a condo, uh, condo here, condo, yeah. here on property. So Beautiful place. It's great because we have a little quiet area. don't have all the noise and commotion of a, of a conference going on. Um, so I'm here for that. Uh, it's like my third year coming up here. I'm super excited to attend the symposium. Uh, we actually both popped into a sparkling wine uh, a, a seminar for like a brief second. But uh, yeah, so Andre, uh, you've already introduced yourself, but kind of tell us who you are, kind of how you got to here. How about that? Yeah, that's a good good question. Okay, so Andre Boada, I, I have a company called Vino Cadre, uh, which I formulated the platform in St. Helena in Napa. Um, I'm from the Napa Sonoma area, so Texans don't hate me here. I'm I'm here to help you as much as I can. I I'm kind of a transplant where I came in to help branding and strategy and development of new wineries coming into the Texas Hill Country, but I also do educational platforms that are designed toward consumers. I've been in the industry uh, 20 years. Um, I kind of got started with the Jackson family portfolio. I was the uh, marketing director of La Crema, which mm -hmm. is a pretty well, pretty well-known brand. I kind of got that up and running at the beginning of the transition when the Jackson family bought the winery. And then I stayed with the company for 14 years. Uh, after working with them, I decided to set up my own company, Vino Cadre, which has really panned out to be a, a great um, platform to help people learn more about wine and to help wineries get to a higher level. Mm -hmm. And actually, I got to uh, experience one of those uh, things that you do for Vino Cadre yeah. on Sunday. So we were over at uh, Turtle Creek. Turtle Creek, right? Olives and okay. Vines. Yeah, so I have several clients here in the area. Turtle Creek Olives and Vine is uh, a new winery uh, being developed in Kerr County, which is you know outside of the main framework of Fredericksburg, but it's starting to expand. And uh, the wineries here, since you know I've been here for about two and a half years, mm -hmm. uh, off and on, going back and forth to California, uh, but this little winery is doing well. Um, they're up to 10 acres of vineyards. They have a beautiful ranch with a working farm and farm animals and a gorgeous villa on, on the estate. And then they have a, a really interesting tasting room downtown in Kerrville on Garrett Street. And last Sunday, uh, I do monthly events, <clears throat> try to theme them around uh, what people really want to get into. Mm -hmm. uh, this last Sunday, we did small batch Cabernets and blends and... It was really cool because you get to try 10 wines with food. Um, there's four different stations. But the, the interesting thing is, you know, you get to try apples to apples. You're not going to a big tasting and you have one winery pouring four wines and then you go to another one pouring four. You're tasting Cabernet. Yeah. And it, you get to really experience uh, seven or eight different countries um, with educated people talking about the wines. You know, I do a VIP session at the beginning. Uh, that really dives deep, but just talks about the wines that are being presented. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I got to I got to experience that, and uh, you know, I should be showing you some B-roll without all that. But um, you have some really cool wines there, like wines that I recognize. Um, but there's also also some stuff I had never had before, and I was super excited to try that. The, how you started off the VIP session with. The, the Bouvet, that was a Cab Franc. Cab Franc, uh, Loire, yeah. yeah, sparkling wine. Cremant, actually, so mm -hmm. um, my viewers hopefully know Cremant is Champagne method outside of Champagne. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that was ex that was really exciting to do that. And then uh, that the Bordeaux you had um, was probably my favorite of the group, which is not surprising <laughs> yeah. for me. Um, but uh, the Italian wines you had, you had, uh, you had some you had some United States stuff. Argentina. Uh, Argentina, yeah. 
So yeah, the El and Amigo was really good. Oh my gosh, yeah. yeah. And that was a Cabernet Franc. If you yeah. ever get a chance to get that, that's pretty special wine. You know, but all the wines had different personalities and uh, intensity levels. Uh, the Bordeaux is just elegant and soft and really yeah. classic uh, Bordeaux. And then you go to Italy, you have Sangiovese as the main blend with the new IGTs which gives a little bit of leeway in Tuscany to kind of do super Tuscan blends. So I had two of those. It was, it was just a fun day. It was. I had a really good time yeah. doing it. And, you know, the foods they had prepared, mm-hmm. um, they had that, was that venison meatloaf? Yeah, venison that meatloaf. A, that was yeah. really good. And then he stuffed it with uh, farm fresh uh, ingredients from the ranch where they yeah. had the vineyards. And uh, it was gorgeous. No, oh, my, you know. I was, and it had great some, day. And that I didn't know there were going to be potatoes there. They had loads of like <laughs> good, like roasted potatoes there. <laughs> like you could almost like have that as your lunch almost. Yeah. And then uh, they had some, uh, they had some truffle chips that were really good. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like the only way I'll actually eat any type of mushroom type of thing is if it's like a truffle flavored stuff. Yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and then they had the charcuterie stuff. They had some cool cheeses there. Yeah. Uh, the Mionette. Was it that right? That's the orange one? Yeah, Mionette. Mi- mi- Mionette. Yep. Yeah, that's yep. a really cool cheese. That was really cool that you had that uh, over there. So, I mean, it was a really good spread, and I was really impressed with it. <clears throat> and I, I told Andre on the phone the other day that while I was watching him do that, he has a really great way of, of I think, explaining stuff for consumers. I told him that, as you all probably know, I go deep a lot of times, probably <laughs> too deep. For the average person, because I'm so excited, I want to tell you everything I know about something. <clears throat> um, and I was watching him. I was like, "That is exactly what if I ever do these things, which is rare, that I need to make sure I don't go down rabbit holes too much." You, you can do a little bit, you know, right, right? I mean, right. obviously, people want more, want to know more. They'll ask you questions, um, but. Well, thanks for the good comment. Yeah, so you, know, you did a really great presentation. I was, right. I was really impressed with it. Well, that's just one of the many things I'm doing in the area, and it's all to help consumers learn more about wine. Uh, I really am focused on Texas wines. I'm trying to help these guys as much as I can. Uh, I, I love what's happening here in the Hill Country. I think the quality of the wines, they're definitely shifting to a higher level. Um, you know, I... I I'm real lucky because I get to work with multiple wineries and see different things happening mm-hmm. in different uh, arenas. And then I also write for a magazine called The Rock and Vine. It's a publication based in Fredericksburg, in case you ever come in and want to read something on what I'm doing. But the area is really taking off. And if you think about Texas, it's shifting at a pretty fast rate. Uh, what I see is a kind of a challenge is do we have enough vineyards you know yeah um the wineries are moving in fast i'm getting calls from california on a regular basis hey what's happening in uh, texas and the quality is there um the the technology is shifting and there's some couple really nice new wineries that are up and coming like slate theory yes they have Interview chase oh my gosh yeah, yeah. so the, ago, so, the yeah. jones family mm-hmm. uh they have the most property under vineyard in the area they have over 150 acres of vineyard right and that's a lot um and what they're doing is they built this state-of-the-art winery it feels like you're going into napa with the wine cave and these little alcoves to do um, events and they'll they'll be pulling me in to host events um but keep an eye out for them another one that i like a lot is uh augusta Venn, which i was a big part of that's kind of what kept me in the area and uh, Scott Felder, the owner, is uh, he planted 60 acres of vineyard. Um, so when you drive by a lot of these wineries, they have this little corridor called 290. You'll see wineries without vineyards. So expect that. But then you come across the ones that really have the vineyards. Mm-hmm. And they're the ones I'm looking at for the future of the area. Yeah. Um, so with, with Slate Theory, so... Uh, Back in September mm-hmm. last year, yeah, yeah, September of last year, because I when I did my relaunch, they were part of my relaunch with with everything. Um, we I went to the Slate Mill Wine Collective, and mm-hmm. so they hadn't that so the, the Slate Theory Winery hadn't it was really just like an idea. I mean, they were constructing it, but they hadn't. You know, all I knew was they're making caves and all that. My, actually, my dad got to see the pictures. I didn't get to see them. <laughs> but I've, now that they're up and running, I've seen the stuff. And actually, on the way from Kerrville to here, I drove by it. I was mm-hmm. like, there it is, you know, next to some other wineries I'm familiar with. 
Um, so I'm definitely going to have to go uh, check that out uh, soon and go check, you know, sit down with uh, Chase and Emily again and, and see, see what they got going on over there. Yeah, they're good people here in Texas. I yeah. mean, the first thing that really resonated with me is the just the kindness and the, of the people, but they're very hardworking and they have high values on high standards. So it's, it's really uh, a beautiful thing for me to share my passion with the people who are trying to make their impact in Texas. Um, quality is shifting higher. Um, the competition mm -hmm. is getting better. Uh, better winemakers are coming in. Better chefs are coming in. Everything is starting to evolve. It kind of reminds me of Sonoma County, uh, where I spent most of my time um, 30 years ago. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, back then there was 75, maybe 80 wineries, almost identical to here. Now there's, in Sonoma, about 500 wineries. Here in this little mecca we're in, there's 75, 80 wineries, but it's growing every day. I know there's 40 more coming in the next yeah. year or two. So there's quite a big shift in the direction and what's happening in the area. The biggest challenge, though, is the number of vineyards. They need to plant more vines. So we'll see yeah, where it Yeah, exactly. Goes. So um, are you seeing them... Uh, concentrating in any part of Texas? I mean, I know that the majority of the fine grape, fine wine grapes are coming from High Plains, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean you can't grow <clears throat> excellent quality grapes in the Hill Country. I just know that there's different challenges here versus High Plains. Um, but are you seeing expansion in this area because most of the wineries are actually over here, or are you seeing it just everywhere in Texas? Uh, it's not everywhere. There's certain park, uh, pockets, uh, but the main two are Hill Country and the High Plains. Yeah. Uh, what, I'm, what I see here in the Hill Country is probably going to evolve into little sub-appellations, sort of mm -hmm. like uh, Sonoma County again, where you had, Sonoma County used to be just one big county of vineyards, and maybe they had Alexander Valley or Russian River, but now they have, what, 16, 17? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I, ABAs. Yeah. Supposedly, so, I, I should be able to rattle them all off right now, but we can't. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it's going to happen here. It's, it's, uh, you got the Perdinalis River. That's a good corridor yeah. for uniqueness. Uh, I know there's some petitions going through to uh, apply for new ABAs or sub appellations of this little place that we're in, and it's pretty big. It's broad. This is a, yeah, yeah. The, the Texas Hill Country as an AVA is a big AVA. It is. Um, and then we have what the Fredericksburg of the yeah. Texas Hill Country. I think that's the that's a sub AVA, and yeah. then I think. Uh, is there another one, or is it, it its own AVA? The not Bell. Not yeah, Bell, 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 uh, Bell Mountain or whatever. Yeah, yeah. There the um, two. So, but there's more coming. Yeah, uh, and I know there's a big initiative by uh, William, William Chris. I don't know if you know much about these guys, but uh, two guys, um, William and Chris, and they formulated a really cool Texas brand, 100% Texas. Uh, Bill, who is a William of William William Chris, is out. He's been doing harvest and making wine for 35 years. So I've been working with him uh, on a project called Turtle Creek and over in Kerrville, and he actually put the vineyards in as a consultant. Oh, cool, okay. Yeah. So um, I, I have a lot of respect for the guy. He and I have done um, some fun projects together. He's, his history is very deep. And then Chris is more the marketing guy of the William Chris. Um, yeah, he's, he's the one I, I've met way more. I've, I've met Bill a few times, mm -hmm. but Chris is, yeah, he's more the face of the winery for yeah. sure. So another thing that happened with William Chris, they have partnered with Andy Timmons. Yes. So Andy Timmons is uh, one of the biggest growers up in the High Plains, and he owns Lost Straw. So Lost Straw <clears throat> and William Chris have now kind of merged together as a company, and they're, um, they're really going after the 100% Texas uh, plateau, which I think is a good thing, but it's, then it's a bad thing, you know, because yeah. there's not enough vineyards. Um, it's a good thing for them because they have control over the vineyards. Right. Um, but what I'm seeing is we need more vineyards for the, all the growth that's taking place. Yeah, so I know that, um, and I don't remember the details of it, but they were one of the people instrumental in getting some legislation passed. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's something like a 90 or 95 percent type of thing. Um, I don't, I'm not up to speed on it. Um, so real briefly, if, if it comes from a state, it has to be 75 percent. Um, if you're doing an AVA... The grapes have to be 85% from the AVA. Um, 
doesn't have it, that, that's the basics. I won't go down the rabbit hole. Yeah. But the push was to get us closer to something like a, I think Washington State's like a hundred percent right has to come from the state mm -hmm. if you're gonna use any type of Washington AVA. The reality is places like Washington, Oregon, and California don't really have to worry about that. Right. Or New York. But we do because especially when you have these all these new wineries coming online, they yes. are importing grapes from basically yeah. California. California. <laughs> Yeah, so most of the wines you'll try when you come to Texas Hill Country are blends. I know because I'm working with a lot of wineries, uh, there are a few players that are trying to be 100% Texas. If you see, if you do come into a winery, look for a state. A state is telling you that this bottle is in a state, that they have to grow the grapes, they have to make the wine, they have to bottle 100%. So if you really want to taste a true Texas wine, yeah. Number one question when you go in, do you have an estate wine? E-S-T-A-T-E, estate. Okay, so that will help you kind of really taste the, the fine work of Texas. Right. Um, but then there's people that do blends. And it's going to be interesting if that bill goes through. I, I think it, they were trying to get 100%. They were, and I think the compromise... Yeah, because there's a, there's a resistance with a lot of winemakers that didn't that want that flexibility to mm -hmm. use a Texas appellation mm -hmm. uh, because Texas is that general one. You, I can get my grapes from here, High Plains and wherever, um, just because I need enough grapes to to make that wine. Yeah, um, it's the same thing as like a California wine. It, they're, they're getting most of it from the Central Valley anyway. But right. um, you know that gives you that flexibility in certain years. You know it's it's you know the high plains had a hard hard year and the hill country had a better year and you can it gives you ways to source stuff. Right. But yeah, there's a resistance to that. But um, at the end of the day, you know, we're trying to as a te as an industry trying to have this. It's a Texas wine, and um, you know not having as much California grapes in the wines here. But like I said, it's it's a matter of you know, it was kind of putting the cart before the horse. We don't have, okay, we have enough vineyards to make wine, <laughs> but we don't have enough vineyards for every single winery to have large production of Texas only grapes. Right. So if I wanted to have a winery that's only going to put out a couple thousand cases, I, I can find, I can find it. Oh, you yeah. Know? Yeah. Small wineries have no <laughs> issue. So in the state, I mean, it's a big state. There's about five, maybe 6,000 acres planted yeah. right now. Okay, sounds like a lot. But if you go to California, there's 600,000 acres. <laughs> yeah. In Napa alone, Napa, 30 miles, right? Maybe a couple of miles wide. There's 45,000 acres of vineyard. So people don't really think about the scale of what we have unless you go to another area and start defining yeah. where you are. So Texas guys, you gotta plant some more vineyards and I'm, I'm here to help you. And I think the quality is going to be really shifting. We just have to get there. So hopefully we can we can put a, put the cart in the right place yeah. and get it going. Uh, exactly. So um, uh, so besides doing events at wineries, you also do other events, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I you host kind of consumer, expanded your you yeah. expanded your company. You have some people in, in different. Towns. Yeah, I have I have quite a few partners. I work with um, some are realtors, some are resorts, like where we are. I get called in to do breakout sessions. I get um, calls to host parties in, in homes, you know, for special groups that, you know, mm -hmm. they're getting together for gatherings. Um, it's always fun. Yeah, you know, it's a great way to pull your family together, be safe, have a controlled environment. I bring the wine. I bring glasses. I bring everything you need. If you want food, I'm, I'm a trained chef on the back end on that. Um, I can prepare and uh, create a, a really cool experience. Mm -hmm. um, I can do blending seminars. I've done barrel samples. The neat thing about Vino Cadre is that we have a, I have access to a lot of different tools to make the experience what I call elevated. And so if you pull me into a situation, I'm going to give you something that you haven't seen and give you an experience from you know a trained professional in the wine industry uh, but also somebody that knows food and wine very well too. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm more of the wine side. I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I've worked are. in a lot of restaurants and I, it's, I do know a decent amount about food, but don't ask me to make anything. Right. Um, 
Well, I've been really Chef lucky. Mike is my friend. Yeah. He's my best friend. If you don't know who Chef Mike is, that's your microwave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In my, in my background, I've worked with uh, Food & Wine Magazine. Yeah. Uh, they have uh, big, beautiful events in Aspen and Pebble Beach and New York. And I've always been part of that team, you know, going in and helping to present work with chefs. So it's, it's really fun to be in front of people at a big scale, but it's also nice to be intimate and do something here locally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, just again, the, the, the event I went to, you know, there was a decent amount of people there. It wasn't like, you know, an event with like 10 people. Yeah. But I think, That's about 50. I think the, uh, the event was well ran. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you had a great partner, uh, with Turtle Creek mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the wines that they, that they had there, uh, for the event, um, I think were excellent. Um, and I'd be, you know, I'm excited to see what they are going to do as a winery themselves. So I know they're, their stuff's just now coming online. There's only a few that we got this here. Right. We only got a few wines for them right now, but um, it'll be really exciting to see what they're going to be doing uh, in yeah, the, the future, few years. The future's really good. Yeah. Um, and they also do olives. <laughs> we, we, it's, olives is part of their name. Actually, it's the first It's actually the first part, olives and vines. Right. So they actually have olive, they call it a grove, right? Yeah. The olive grove, yeah. Right. Um, so the history of the winery is really interesting because they started with olives, Um that the owners, uh, Dan and Sue yeah. Schultze, decided to put in olive trees. Uh, well, olives don't grow as well as they should in Texas, the <laughs> crazy weather. So he experimented with 400 vines and put in a small little vineyard, and it took off. So from that, he's planted uh, 10 acres, and, yeah. it's, and it's doing well. Yeah, And the wines are great. Yeah. Um, cool. I, was, I was actually really impressed with the quality of the wines. They're made by a guy up and coming to winemaker Kyle Allen. Okay. Um, really interesting guy, really has a passion for making uh, as clean as a wine as he can. This is unfiltered. Um, everything he's doing is great, but you, you have to think about the vineyards who are all put in by Bill Blackman of William Chris. So, yes. You know, they have the right elements to make that place really take off. Yeah. It's, you can make really great wine from great grapes. Mm -hmm. You can also make really bad wine from great grapes. <laughs> yeah. You have to start with excellent material. Um, it's really hard to make excellent wine from subpar grapes. Yeah. And you have to, I hate the word, you have to manipulate the you know what out of it to make it palatable, but you're not gonna, you're not gonna, that, that, the grapes that went into that $10 bottle of wine, you're not gonna make them taste like a $100 bottle. Right. Um, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, like this particular wine, this is a red blend they put together. It's yeah. a Cabernet blend, but it's mostly Monte Pulciano. Um, that's the, the base of it. And then you have Cabernet and Merlot. And it's all coming from the vineyards that they own. So it's, it's an estate bottling. Um, Cabernet is kind of tricky to grow here in Texas. You, yeah. It's a late ripening grape. So you, if you don't have the right elements, it can be kind of herbaceous and kind of green pepperish versus that pretty black fruit. Uh, but this turned out really nice. Uh, I think the Monte Pulciano, which is really pretty cherry cola kind of essence with a little licorice kind of profile, uh, gives it the back, uh, the fun fruit flavor. And then the mm -hmm. Cabernet gives it a little structure with the Merlot kind of yeah. softness on the back end. Yeah, uh, I've in, in conversations and in, in going around the state, you know, uh, it seems like Italian varieties are doing well here. Italian. Um, of course, um, most Rhone people... varietals. Rhone varietals, people seem to uh, associate Tempranillo with, with, um, with Texas. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're kind of getting a reputation of having the non-standard um, Bordeaux varieties. Uh, we're not, not relying so much on Bordeaux varieties. So there are, we have plenty of wineries that, that are sticking to their tried and trues. Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Chardonnay, not much Pinot, thankfully. Um, mm -hmm. I hear there's good Pinot in Texas. I just haven't had any yet. I, I just haven't. Really haven't had any Pinot from Texas. Not that I've had bad. Um, yeah, we're but kind of, we're, oh, we're almost at a disadvantage here because the, the number one white wine in the world that people consume is Chardonnay. Chardonnay yeah. <laughs> Chardonnay is just kind of tricky to grow here. Although um, Adega Vina, which is another winery in Stonewall Hill Country, yeah. they just got a double gold at San Francisco International. Cool. So that's you know that's telling you something, guys. Um, I've been a judge of that competition, and it is not easy to get a double gold in their price point they were going after. So yeah. I was pretty impressed. So there is potential to do cool climate grapes, but it's not 
this place is not designed for it. So no. you take a risk. But, yeah, you, but you if, you, if you pull it off, you can do it. Yeah. Cabernet, same thing. You know, the number one red wine in the world doesn't grow good here in Texas, but there are people that are doing a great job, like Ben Calais. Yes, uh, Ben is awesome. It, yeah, really a talented he's, he's guy. He's another one I still got to get an interview from, but yeah. I, I've, I've met him and tasted with him, so he's uh, got some great stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's great wineries here, uh, beautiful places to visit. Another place you may want to think about is Signor. Uh, Signor is um, in, a, in a, like a little triangle, of, um, like the who's who in uh, hill country. So you have Signor, you have Slate Theory, which mm-hmm. I talked about earlier, and then you have uh, Heath and Grape Creek. Yeah. And, and they're right across the street from each other. You, you don't have to go anywhere. You just go boom, boom, boom. It's like a triangle. And you'll have the best time. You got sparkling wine, you got big reds, mm-hmm. you got um, Signor, which is mainly Texas, but they have a little twist of Oregon with Chardonnay and Pinot because it doesn't grow yeah. good here. Uh, so it's kind of fun. And then Slate Theory is just like, Oh my God, what's going on in this place? So come explore, come come see what's happening. If you are coming into the area, you should definitely try to reach out to me. Vino Cadre just uh, has all my information, vinocadre.com, or follow me on Instagram or, um, of course, Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely have all of his in, in, the, in the description below. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything, I have all the links. You can click that. Um, you definitely need to check out what Andre's doing. Yeah, it's fun. Um, you know, you'll, you'll walk away saying that was a cool experience. So. Yeah, and uh, you know this 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 uh, conference is how I even got to meet him actually through a mutual associate of ours mm-hmm. um, because I posted out saying hey I'm going to be at the symposium uh, if anyone wants an interview and a gentleman that um, I don't think I don't think I've ever actually met Andrew in person uh, um, Andrew but Andrew Chalk, Chalk uh, does a lot of writing in Texas very big advocate for Texas wines and uh, being a hundred percent Texas wines. Um, he told me I should reach out to Andre and I did. So I thank Andrew, uh, for doing that. And, uh, so it's a really great experience to, to be able to do that. Um, anything else we need to chat about? I think we're at a good stopping point. I think so. Yeah. Just, uh, come, come see it. Um, the best time to come would be spring and the fall. Summertime gets kind of hot in here in Texas. So if you are coming, just be prepared for the heat. Uh, last summer wasn't so bad. The winters no, can be kind of cold. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right now it's what sixty. It's uh, we'll see. We'll see what it says. It's it's sixty five degrees right now in January, guys. But, but tomorrow's um, supposed to be a little bit. Co- not uh, Thursday's supposed to be a little bit colder. Yeah. But here, here, yeah, here, here's a weather pattern: sixty five today, twenty five on Thursday. So <laughs> it's it's like that. Last year we had a a really tough freeze right in February where yeah. it, it shut down the state. I don't know if you remember that. It was like Valentine's Day. Oh, uh, I luckily, <laughs> yeah, luckily, you know, bud break didn't happen until after, uh, but it did affect the uh, the vines wanting to even open up and yeah. get out and start talking to us again. I know that um, I had uh, texted uh, Neil Newsom during all that and wanted to just check up on him you know, uh, to make sure that uh, they were okay out there in Plains, Texas. Um, and then, of course, you know, uh, it, was, it wasn't like right in the thick of things because he's not going to be able to give me that answer. But it was kind of like later on, I was like, so have you been able to check out the vines yet, see if there's any winter kill? And he was like, he, think, he said, we think we're okay. But he's probably, he probably going to have some winter kill. I hope to see him uh, this week. Mm-hmm. Um, if not, hopefully if I get to Twiga, I'm sure I'll see him there and I can talk to him about stuff. But That'll be on a topic of conversation with with a lot of people here that I haven't been able to see for you know a couple of years. You know how's things going? You know how how did the last year affect your your vines? Um, I got to when I went around um, last year in the sub- September, I was able to get a little bit of information. But um, to talk to the actual growers um, is always important to me. Right. All right. Well, uh, Andre, I think we'll we'll wrap this up, uh, folks. Uh, definitely check out what he's got going on here in Texas. If you're local, for sure, uh, check him out. If you're visiting and you need some extra information, need some help figuring out where to go, he's a great source uh, to tap into. Uh, That's going to do it. Uh, Just make sure you hit a like and subscribe to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Also, tell your friends about the best wine show anywhere because, well, that's at least I'm being, I'm pat myself on the back all the time on that one. But yeah, um, yeah, so we will see you. Uh, next time with some more interviews.